communication. Right, and the swiping no. that apes don't well, that's, swipe. That's a, whole, that's, that's a very interesting topic too, the, the, uh, like the Tinder phenomenon. That's, right. that, that's an, also a major technological revolution because what it's done, I would say, for the first time, is reduce the cost of rejection to males to zero because it hides it. The only people you ever hear from are people who haven't rejected you. Although, although they, true, but, but there was one, one man who had to make 300, he, he actually tallied it. Yeah. He had to make 300 requests of swiping right or whatever yeah. for to one reply. One. So right. I think he right. had the sense of rejection. Sure, 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 but it's massively attenuated. Yeah. And it, you know, it's because, not observed. Yeah, you're not being humiliated. Not right. at all, right. not at all. It's really, right. it's really at arm's length and you know, you can right. swipe very, very rapidly and so you can get all that rejection <laughs> over with in a very short period of time. Right, it's like losing a video game or something. Mm -hmm. going or le well, less. Because Worse. It's, 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 not a, I mean, not nearly as bad. Yeah. So, and you know, I, I, I don't know what, and I mean, Tinder also reduces the, one of the other things that, things that you want to think about with regards to sex, and I think this is probably particularly true for women, is that to what degree is it in women's interests to allow the cost of sex to fall to zero? Because with pornography certainly does that. And it just seems to me that that's not a very good long-term strategy for relationships between men and women, because whatever sex is worth, the cost of zero is the wrong price. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, I, well, I've heard You can go to the from, bunny ranch and pay quite a bit for it. Well, true, <laughs> true, but, but that's true, but you, you know, you don't have to. And, no. you know, I've heard from a number of women, what written, read blog reports on their frustration with their attempts to be relatively sexually selective. Like, let's say they decide that they're not going to sleep with their new partner on the first date. You know, they're frustrated by the fact that to the degree that they're being cautious in their sexual behavior, which I think is actually an admirable idea, that they're instantly outcompeted, especially if their partners are somewhat impulsive, by women who will say yes at the drop of a hat. And so, well, again, I don't think, you know, it depends on what the goal is. That's the thing, is that there's the short term, there's short term sexual gratification, but the literature indicates that married couples, for example, or couples in a permanent long term monogamous relationship are more sexually satisfied than single people. And maybe the single people have to be parsed out into those who are sexually successful and those who aren't. But I, I suspect that wouldn't make that much difference, but whatever. There's the utility of relatively immediate sexual gratification for whatever that's worth and the adventurousness that goes along with that, let's say, the hunt and the excitement of having a new partner and all of that, and maybe even the danger that's associated with that because people like to have a little bit of danger in their life. But what's the goal? It's like, what do people want? And I mean, there, there's a great book called A Billion Wicked Thoughts that was written by Google engineers. And so it contains great psychology because Google engineers don't care about political correctness and they just write down what they find and they don't even notice that it's politically incorrect. Hence James Damore, for example. And what they found was that women use pornography just as much as men, but the pornography that women use is verbal. It's not imagistic. And that the pornographic novels, essentially, follow the same extraordinarily standard plot line to the degree that publishing houses like Harlequin, which I was going to say, it's the it's the bodice rippers, the that's romance right. novels. Yeah, right. So in, in the Harlequin series, you have you know the ones that were published like in the 1970s that are pretty they're tame. There's a small they, bit they, of, they're pretty hot actually. Well, <laughs> there, there's a variety. They yeah. they range no, from they range from completely them. tame to essentially to hardcore pornography. But the <laughs> but the the plots are quite similar, and the plot is. Um, you know, young, relatively innocent woman finds powerful, interesting, dangerous male, tames him, and then they live happily ever, ever after. Love. Yeah, yes. yeah, and it's the Beauty and the Beast plot, which yes. is a fundamental. Wasn't the which is a biggest search for women on Pornhub we discovered? We did an episode on porn. Was uh, for women? It was rape. Wasn't that like the no show? lesbianism? Or at least that was your porn. Yeah, that was your. That's search. not me. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't know. I don't know. You know what I my say. porn is? Going to the Williams Sonoma store. I know. It, I, I, it is. It is female porn. All those pots. Oh, the pots and pans. <laughs> no, but, 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 but Bill Maher, the down. philosopher Bill Maher, yes. once said that yes. men and women should never tell one another their fantasies, because women are outraged by what we say 
and we're totally bored by what they say. <laughs> and I thought, like, women have kind of these scenarios and, you know, I don't know, unicorns. I don't know what they're doing. Storylines. Storylines. And men Story is just lines. like, uh, I don't want to say this to you, but it is a lot of just close-ups of female body parts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, men are much more visually oriented and, I know. and sexually. And but now they're being shamed. I mean, now they, it's called the male gaze. Mm -hmm. And so there's all of this like, oh, my God, the Sports Illustrated is exploiting the female figure. I think, yeah, I mean, men like it. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm worried that now sort of the way in the past um, sexual sub, you know, gays were shamed, we're now reversing it and shaming like heterosexual. Yes, that's attraction. definitely well, that's well, definitely happening. Remember, we had the young yeah. woman who complained about being whistled at, and I said, "Don't worry, it stops." Yeah. <laughs> so, um, do we have a little bit of time for a couple more topics mm -hmm. with you? Mm -hmm. uh, because one of the things that is coming out of this younger generation, and you have a chapter of it in your book, oh, which I don't. Sorry, I wanted to finish what the, the line that we were pursuing. Oh, oh I sorry. Should do that. Sorry. Well, with sexual behavior, the question is, what's the end game? And that this is what people have to ask themselves: is like one of the corollaries to the female pornographic romance is actually the establishment of a long-term relationship. And the question is, you know, it's so funny because I got pilloried in the New York Times um, for, for talking about enforced monogamy. It's quite interesting, eh? Because They'll, I talked that, to that, the, that gets brought up like in every oh, snarky so interview. Oh, it's so ridiculous. so ridiculous. <laughs> I talked to that woman for two, two days. I know, and it's just like a little side comment, and then that became yeah. like the Can you center, just explain, the showcase. Like, like enforced monogamy. You mean forced marriage, or no? I mean that it was an anthropological term, which she knew perfectly well because she's a very smart person, um, and all it means is that there's a pronounced proclivity in human societies around the world to enforce monogamous relationships at multiple levels of the sociological hierarchy. You do it culturally. You do right. it. You do right. it right. in right. expectation. Right. Right. You do right. it legally. You know, an enforced monogamy, so it, my son was just married, and if he came to me next year and he said, you know, hey, Dad, guess what? I've managed to have four affairs in the last year with hot women, and my wife hasn't found out about any of them. I'm not going to pat him on the back and say, <laughs> good job, kid. You know, I'm going to say, what the hell's up with you? You know, you violated the vow that you took. You're putting your whole future at risk. You're betraying yourself and your wife. And Well, that's enforced monogamy, you know, the... Uh, the idea is that the social norm is the establishment of a long-term monogamous relationship and that there are strictures put in place to support that but also to punish deviation from it. And you say, well, you know, maybe, maybe not so much on the punishment end, but you can't, it depends. It's like, what do you want? What, what is it that you want? You want a long-term stable relationship or not? And if that's the goal, then your behavior should be devoted to whatever it is that facilitates that goal. And I don't see that... I certainly don't see that casual and impulsive sex fits that bill, not, not in the least. And all of the evidence with regards to living together shows that that's actually detrimental to the establishment of a long-term relationship. So, first of all, common law marriage, people who are in a common law marriage are much more likely to be, be divorced. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, people who live together before they get married are much more likely to be divorced after they get married. So the idea that, well, you can try someone on for size and see how it works, and then you're going to see if you're compatible, it's like, that's one story. Another story is, well, how about you and I live together for a little while, and, you know, if you're, you're not so bad, but maybe I can find someone better, and if I do, you know, in the next year and a half or so, because we're not hooked together in any formal way, I can just trade you in. It's okay, you can do the same to me. But I don't really see that as the sort of complementary mutual interaction that leads to the formulation of long-term trust. And I think it's a better story for interpreting what constitutes living together than, well, you know, we're going to try each other out because that's what mature people would do. It's a it's lease like, or a rental. Yeah, well, that's you right. wash it's, the rental yeah, cars or you use Yeah, it. yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that's it. And, and, and but, but more most importantly, yeah. the data indicate that it doesn't work is that you're more likely to get divorced, not less likely. Because maybe the right attitude is, well, you're probably about as flawed as me, and you know, we're lucky that we found each other, and so let's see if we can make a commitment, because we're engaging in something that's very risky, you know, an intimate relationship, and we're going to commit to each other and see if we can build something of value across time. And there's a definite a risk in that, but there's a compliment to your partner. It's like, well, I think you're worth making a sacrifice for. And what's the sacrifice? Well, it's everyone else. It's a big sacrifice. And, there's, and if you don't see that as a compliment, then I don't think you're thinking. Because not only is it a compliment, it's sort of like the ultimate compliment. And maybe you don't get to have a marriage 
that works without that complement. Maybe it's so difficult to establish a long-term relationship that's functional that you have to make a walloping sacrifice very early on in the relationship in order for that to even be a possibility. And, you know, maybe not, because what the hell do we know about what binds people together? But, but it's not that easy to stay with someone for a long period of time. You know, it's, it's, a, real, it's a real commitment. It takes a tremendous amount of effort. So, anyways. Yeah, but